Hi there. There's been a bit of delay in me producing videos for three or four weeks because I got rid of my old second-hand Hewlett-Packard computer and ordered parts for a new uh, machine from China and I had to wait for them to come and build it etc. So I've now decided to take up a suggestion someone made to produce a video on inflation which is obviously a very topical issue and this is actually one of the first issues that I ever wrote any articles on in Marxist economics about um, back in the early 1970s when there was a high rate of inflation. So I'm rehearsing at a more sophisticated level the arguments which I presented then and these are all drawn from what Marx said about inflation and wage, prof, wage and prices in a little pamphlet, Wages, Prices and Profit. We've all heard of the wage price spiral where government ministers say that current waves of strikes are useless since wage rises will just lead to price inflation, that one person's wage increase is another person's price increase. This is a very old form of anti-union propaganda and one that Marx refuted in this short book of his. It's the, the text is based on an address that Marx gave to two sessions of the General Council of the First International in June 1865, which is just after he'd finished writing Capital, but before any of any volumes were published. And it addresses the contention of one of the members of the Council that fighting for wage increases is pointless since it just results in price increases that cancel them. And as I've said, this remains a common argument against trade unionism. The summary of Weston's argument was that if the working class forces the capitalist class to pay five shillings instead of four shillings in the shape of money wages, the capitalists will return in the shape of commodities four shillings worth instead of five shillings worth and the working class will have to pay five shillings for what, before the rise in wages, they had bought for f four shillings. Well, Marx responds to this by saying, by what contrivance is the capitalist enabled to return four shillings for five shillings? By raising the price of the commodity sales. Now, does a, a rise, and more generally a change in the prices of commodities, or do the prices of commodities themselves depend on the mere will of the capitalist? Or are they, on the contrary, certain circumstances wanted to give effect to that will? If not, the ups and downs, the incessant present fluctuations of market prices would become an insoluble ri riddle. What would a wage rise do? How would wage rises affect the prices of commodities? Only by affecting the actual proportions between demand for and supply of these commodities, he says. But what are wages spent on? This is what his response is. He says, as a whole, the working class spends and must spend its income on necessa necessaries. A general rise in the rate of wages would therefore produce a rise in the demand for and consequently in the market price of necessities. The capitalists who produce these necessities will be compensated for the risen wages by the rising market price of their commodities, so they don't lose anything. But how about the capitalists who produce other things who don't produce necessities? And this is Marx saying again, and you must not fancy them a small body. If you consider that two-thirds of national produce are consumed by one-fifth of the population, you will understand what an immense proportion of the national produce must be produced in the form of luxuries, or be exchanged for luxuries, and what an immense amount of necessities themselves must be wasted on flunkies, horses, cats and so forth. 
Well, those are 19th century figures. At the moment, the top fifth of the UK population consumes 42% of national income. And you can reasonably assume that at least half of that is luxuries. That is the excess they have over the average income in the country. So the direct expenditure of the upper classes on luxuries is around 22% of national income. Now we know that real wages in Britain have fallen 5.5% since 2010. So re if you reduce the luxury consumption of the upper classes merely by a quarter, that would make up the wage loss that the working classes have faced. Now, Marx looks at what the effect of wage rises would be on luxury production. What would be the position of capitalists who do not produce necessaries? For the fall in the rate of profit consequent on the general rise of wages, they would not compensate themselves by a rise in the price of commodities, because the demand for those commodities would not have increased. Their income would have decreased, and from this decreased income, they would have to pay more for the same amount of necessities. But that wouldn't be all. As their income had diminished, they would have less to spend on luxuries, and therefore their mutual demand for their respective commodity would diminish. So overall he's saying demand for wage for goods goes up, demand for luxuries falls when wages rise. So after wage rises the production of luxuries is less profitable. Capital and labour shift to producing consumption goods for workers' rise wages instead, and real wages rise. Now, what Wages, Prices and Profit was a speech given by Marx just after he'd wrote Capital and before it was published. And he debated with Engels whether the pamphlet should be published or not, thinking it would detract from his book which was about to come out. And in fact it wasn't published until after his death. But in Wages, Price and Profit, which I can strongly recommend as an introduction to Marx's economic thought, he uses techniques that he describes in full in Volume 2 of Capital, which is devoted to what he calls reproduction schemes. So I'm going to now illustrate Marx's argument about inflation by drawing in the apparatus that he presents in Capital to show his reasoning that he presents as a finished result in this little pamphlet. Now, this is a, a reproduction scheme that Marx uses in Capital. Um, it's a brief explanation of some of the, the terminology here. C stands for constant capital, which is what he calls a means of production. V is variable capital or wages. S is surplus value, which is profit, interest and rent, but we'll simplify it at the moment to assume it all goes as profit. The sectors of the economy are one, which produces means of production, two, which produces necessities, 2A, which produces necessities, and 2B, which produces luxuries, arms, etc. Now, I have slightly simplified his account because in his account he assumes that the capitalists don't only consume luxuries but they also consume some of the same goods as the working class. I've simplified it to assume they spend it all on luxuries because the argument is clearer under those circumstances. And Let's go along one row here. In Department 1, there's a, a cap, constant capital advance of £100, so we'll make it £100 billion. Um, the, there's a variable capital of £50 billion. There are profits of £50 billion. They use 100 units of labour. Well, let, let's assume those are billion hours of labour. And the total value of output was 200 billion of pounds of means of production. Okay, 
and that's the, the, the layout of the table in general. And there are important constraints that Marx says a reproduction scheme has to meet. The total output of means of production here has to equal the total use of means of production in all three departments. The total output of necessities has to equal the total wages paid across all departments. And the total amount of luxuries produced has to equal the total profits. As I said, he, he presents a slightly different um, version where the capitalists spend a fraction of their income on necessities as well, but that makes it a lot more complicated to, to see what the core of the argument is. And the rate of exploitation is 100% which is what he normally assumes in, in, in his examples. Now, I'm going to show by simulation the individual steps that he explains in Capital. And one of the reasons why Volume 2 of Capital is regarded as hard is that in Volume 2 of Capital, Marx is basically inventing macroeconomics. And he's inventing economic simulation. And he's doing what amounts to a computed simulation of the economy, but doing the computations by hand, by paper and pencil methods, and presenting them as tables. And he's doing all this before the spreadsheet was invented. So he's essentially doing spreadsheets, but he's doing spreadsheets by hand and presenting them as printed spreadsheets. It's all well before the technology was available. Now, it's a step-by-step -step simulation of how a capitalist economy works and how it reproduces a situation where the workers have no money, capitalists have all the money, and capitalists have all the commodities to sell. And I've done a computer animation of it uh, that summarize, sorry, that simulates the process that was summarized in the previous spreadsheets. In the text in Capital, the stages of this simulation are explained in English or in German words with the numeric examples written down. So here is how the system starts. Which starts out in a situation well, let's explain what the diagram is. This part here is what the spreadsheet showed, the value part. But behind the scenes, there is a physical reproduction going out, physical units. And since we're dealing with inflation, where prices can d diverge from values, there's another separate parallel money uh, part going on. And the other things you have to keep track of is the amount of cash the different people have, the amount of cash the capitalists in each sector have, and the amount of cash the workers have got, what the prices and the values of the goods are, and what the target level of production that the capitalists in each department have, what they aim to produce in the current period, because it's on the basis of their current production plans that they advance capital in the form of constant capital and variable capital. So the, the, those advances of capital are always in order to realize a particular production plan. So first thing that happens is the capitalists pay wages to the workers to hire labor. The workers now have cash, but the capitalists still have all the commodities which the workers might buy. So the capitalists have less cash, but they've still got plenty left. The next thing is the cap having bought variable capital, the capitalists purchase constant capital. So they purchase the capitalists in all department purchase means of production. So they've now got the stock of means of production and the stock of variable capital that they need to continue production. And after this, the capitalists in department one have more cash because sales have they've sold means of production to the other departments next stage he has is that the workers spend their wages and at the end of that the workers have got no wages but they've 
had something to eat and the capitalists in department 2A now have lots of money. They've got all the money the workers spent. The workers have got enough to survive during the working period. He doesn't specify what the period is, but let's, I've said a year, but a month would be more realistic. The next phase is the capitalists spend their surplus on luxuries. They spend any money they have over and above what they'd had to advance for, for new capital. Anything that they have left over after they've advanced for their replacement of their capital, they regard that as profit which they can now spend on luxuries. So all the capitalists now have their money capital returned. The capitalists in 2B now have their money capital returned because the other capitalists have bought luxuries off them. So the system is now in a position to, to start reproduction again and after production has occurred we're back in the situation before. All the means of production and, and labour power have been used up. There is an output and that output has a value and a price and the workers now have no cash and the capitalists are in a position to sell the goods that the workers have produced back to them at a profit. So that's how the system reproduces itself. The money all ends up in the hands of the capitalists, the workers end up with no money and the capitalists end up with commodities ready to sell. Now let's look what happens when wages rise by 10%. And I'm going to use a simulation of his volume 2 argument or scheme in order to explain his argument in wages, prices and profits. And I'm going to skip out some of the simulation steps because I ran the simulation for a large number of steps and I only sh show you illustrative effects. The first thing we do is we raise wages by 10%. That's all that's changed out from the start of year zero. Wages are now 0.55 or 55 pence a, a, a unit of time run 50 pence a unit of time. After wages have been paid, workers now have 10% more cash than they had the year before. Fair enough. Will they be able to get any more commodities? No, because no more necessities have been built, have been produced this year. So what happens is that the price of necessities has risen from 250 to 275, which is what Weston said would happen. But this is just the first step. The capitalists in department two have more cash than they had last year. So they're in a position to expand production. And they've got an incentive to do so because they're able to sell their goods above their value. And after luxury expenditure has been made, the capitalists in department 2B find that the price of luxuries has fallen from £4 to £3.60 and they have less cash than last year to continue production. So that has an effect on what they plan to produce the next year. The capitalists in department 2A will plan to increase their production target and the capitalists in, in department 2B to reduce theirs. I intend to put a link online to the program in Java which simulates this so you can try it yourself. What I do is I adjust the production targets by the square root of the ratio of prices to values. I don't reduce, adjust them by the ratio of prices to values because if you do that you'll tend to overshoot a bit so I've done it by the square root of the ratio. One year later, so I've now skipped a whole year of stages. One year later, the output of necessities has increased. And that means that real workers' living standards will have risen. And the output of luxuries has gone down. The 
ne net effect of that is that prices and values though are still not in equilibrium you can see that the price of ne uh, necessities is still above its value and the price of luxuries is still below their value so the adjustment process is going to continue and the rate of exploitation has now fallen because workers really are consuming more in value terms the value of output of necessities has gone up and the value of output of luxuries has gone down so there's been a real fall in the rate of exploitation now I'm not going to run through all the stages to move to a new equilibrium I'll just show it as a the, the new stable state has a spreadsheet and in fact you can compute using a spreadsheet what the new stable state would be so in the there is a shift in resources from department 2b to 2a the wage rate has risen the amount of constant capital in department 2a is stable now at 55 and is down to 45 in 2b the number of workers has gone up from 200 or 200 million or what have you in um, department 2a and gone down in department 2b the rate of exploitation has falls in the end to 81.81 percent and we now have a stable situation since the total constant capital used is the total constant capital produced the total wages paid and the total value of necessities and the total um, luxuries spent the total spending on luxuries is equal to the total value of luxuries and that is the new equilibrium the thing about Marx's reproduction schemes is you can readily compute what the new equilibrium will be um, without having to run through all the simulation steps in between and it's worth mentioning that the intellectual origins of both national income accounting and input output tables can be found in these reproduction schemes in capital and because he had pioneered the whole field of macroeconomic analysis Marx could easily deal with Western's objection that wage rises simply result in price rises and as we've shown that's not what happens what happens is they result in an increase in real wages and a decline in real luxury consumption but that doesn't get into what's causing the current inflation the current inflation is not being caused by wage increases the current inflation is basically due to real shortages of production which occurred first due to the Covid crisis meaning that fewer working days were performed each year and secondly because the United States has blown up the pipelines that supply Europe with energy with the objective of being able to sell high-cost Norwegian and US gas to Europe which has drastically increased energy prices these increase in energy prices are a result of an artificially politically enforced reduction in supply that is carried out to benefit basically the US oil and gas monopolies